Uh, our final paper is from Audra Murfeld Langston, who is interim chair. Um, and I might mention, oh, no, we'll get to you. <laughs> Sorry, interim chair and associate professor of French in the Department of Arts, Languages, Philosophy at Missouri University of Science and Technology. She has her PhD from Penn State. Um, and like I say, she's an interim chair. Um, and she's published quite a, quite a number of um, articles and uh, is completed. Is this an article or, or a book manuscript? Uh, I'm, I will gradually finish a book manuscript. <laughs> it, it, it sounds great. It's called Sex Life and black marketeering, Marcel Aimé's Le Chemin des Écoliers and the National Revolution in Occupied Montmartre. And today she'll be speaking, her, her pa paper is titled Confronting an Uncomfortable Past, Representations of Wartime France in Marcel Aimé's Le Vin de Paris. Le Vin de Paris, sorry. Okay. During the purge, many of Marcel Aimé's acquaintances urged him to lie low, given that he had published in the collaborationist press, press and counted among his friends some unsavory ones, including Céline, Robert Brasillac, and Maurice Bardèche. Instead, however, Aimé vociferously fought for their right to express their opinions, even if they were unpopular or morally problematic ones. He urgently but unsuccessfully sought to save Brasillac from the death penalty. The latter was executed in February 1945. Thereafter, Aimé held a permanent and public grudge against Charles de Gaulle for not having pardoned him. Many of Aimé's criticisms of the justice of both the war period and the post-war period appear in his voluminous writings. Convinced that a writer's duty was to be the witness of his time, Aimé infused his fiction with references to current or recent past events. For example, contradictions of the myth of resistance and uncomfortable glimpses of how the French treated the French during World War II abound in Le Chemin des Écoliers from 1946, Le Vin de Paris in 1947, Uranus in 1948, and La Tête des Autres in 1952. This paper will examine one of these, Le Vin de Paris, in detail and demonstrate how this collection of short stories offers readers a literary counter-history to other post-war narratives that sought to establish the Gaullist myth of resistance. Indifference, hypocrisy, and deceit are just a few of the salient themes that dominate this powerful collection. Le Vin de Paris offers us a site of contested memory in literary form and provides rich material for examining a perspective on French behavior from 1939 to 1947. Aimé's versatility as a writer led him to publish novels, short stories, plays, and screenplays. He also worked as a journalist until his death in 1967. Raised in the Jura, Aimé moved to Paris as a young man and spent the rest of his life living in Montmartre, which he used as the backdrop for many of his stories. His early works gained him popularity, especially his novel La Jument Verte, and he became known for his use of humor and playfulness. Later, especially during and after the occupation, his penchant for humor would adopt a much darker hue as it appeared as bitter irony or sarcasm. Aimé's voluminous writings clearly demonstrate his talent as an observer of human nature and daily life. He was described by contemporary Claude-Henri Marcel as constructing his fictional universe from his flânerie in the Butte Montmartre and his patient observation of the shopkeepers of La Rue Le Pic, the thugs of Place Pigalle and the petit bourgeois of Batignolles. Marcel Aimé spent the war years in Montmartre, where he continued to observe and record, in both factual and fictional form, what he saw around him. A journalist before the war, he continued to publish articles in the press during the war because he needed the money to support his family. For Aimé and many others, as Giselle Sapiro notes, journalism provided both, quote, a means of accessing the literary field and a means of subsistence. In fact, journalism was the main source of income for one out of four writers, end quote. The 18 articles M.A. published during the occupation appeared in newspapers including Je suis partout, uh, La Gerbe, and Aujourd'hui. During the same period, M.A. also published three novels in serialized form, La Belle Image, La Vouivre, and Travolin, each later published by Gallimard, and he wrote short stories, film dialogues, and screenplays. Though his works contained no pro-German or anti-Semitic content, he was criticized after the war, but not blacklisted for having published at all in the collaborationist press. He did receive a non-public reprimand in 1946 for having sold a screenplay to the German film, uh, German firm Continental, Continental. 
In the post-war period, Emmy confronted the occupation and the liberation head-on, penning short stories, plays, and novels that critique wartime behavior in France. Le Chemin des Écoliers, for example, provides a sobering look at individual families and black market dealings in Paris during the occupation, while his novel Uranus depicts a small town suffering under the impress oppressive environment created by the liberation and the shifting of power from Vichy supporters to the communists. His play La Tête des Autres serves as a scathing critique of the post-war justice system. In each of these, and in his many other writings, Aimé combines his skill as an observer of human nature and as a chronicler, albeit in fictional form, of historical circumstance. The same holds true for Le Vin de Paris, a collection of eight short stories published by Gallimard in 1947. Most of the stories in the collection are set between 1939 and 1946, and within them we find many familiar MA themes. For context, I will give very brief summaries here before proceeding with a closer look, um, closer analysis about the ways in which they depict World War II and its aftermath. In L'Indifférent, readers encounter a man who finds employment remorselessly robbing and killing people. Traversé de Paris recounts the story of two characters illegally transporting goods across the capital at night while avoiding capture. La Grasse follows the travails of a saintly man whose wife convinces him to sin repeatedly with the aim of eliminating the brightly glowing halo shining over his head. <laughs> In the story Le Vin de Paris, uh, a man obsessed with wine becomes convinced that his father-in-law and eventually everyone he sees have uh, transformed into wine bottles. Dermuche tells the story of a simple-minded criminal imprisoned for murder who miraculously transforms into a baby version of himself complete with miniature tattoos um, <laughs> on the eve of his execution. La Fosse au Péché presents us with a new twist on the classic battle between good and evil that takes place at the bottom of the sea. Le Faux Policier, as one might imagine, is about a man pretending to be a police officer, in this case to rob his victims for his family's profit. Finally, in La Bonne Peinture, an artist's paintings are discovered to provide nourishment to those who gaze at them. Each of these stories brings together a cast of characters typical of Aimé's overall corpus of novels, plays, and short stories that in one way or another address the period leading up to World War II, the war itself, and its aftermath. Thus, we find corrupt or incompetent officials, cheating spouses, dysfunctional families, unfortunate victims of circumstance, unappreciated artists, scheming profiteers, and more. Most of these stories clearly reference the overall atmosphere of wartime France. The black market appears as a daily reality. It constitutes the entire premise of La Traversée de Paris. The story opens dramatically with these words, La victime, déjà dépassée, gisait dans un coin de la cave. Several tense paragraphs later, readers realize that the victim is not a person, but a butchered pig, and that the butcher was nervously awaiting the arrival of Martin, who was to transport the meat across Paris in suitcases. But Martin shows up with a new accomplice, Grand Guil, who coerces the butcher into paying him 5,000 francs for the job, rather than the originally agreed upon 300 francs. Martin and Grand Guil then navigate the darkened streets of Paris, where Martin constantly frets about being discovered. In a cafe, Martin sees a Jewish girl and worries not about her safety, but about a possibly impending roundup that would bring unwanted attention to their suitcases from both French and German officers. They must dodge a German bike squad, stay away from homes requisitioned by the German army and guarded by the police. When an alert sounds, they take refuge in Grand Guil's apartment, where Martin learns that Grand Guil is actually an artist in his tough guy facade throughout the evening, merely an act. Martin, humiliated, kills him, delivers the black market goods to a butcher shop in Montmartre, and is ultimately arrested by agents who discover the murder. When questioned about why he committed the crime, Martin responds simply, on ne fait pas ce qu'on veut, allez. Other characters throughout the collection of stories display a similar attitude about not being responsible for their actions and about having to adapt to the times. However, as Aimé weaves these types of statements into his stories, it is clear that the characters are not meant to be believed, that they do have choices, and that most do not take the moral high road, opting instead for scheming to benefit their selfish interests. 
The references to the black market as it appears in the stories of Le Vin de Paris focus mostly on food. Hunger and thirst torment many of the characters whose ration cards, if they have them, do not adequately nourish them or their families. Lack of nourishment pushes the protagonist of Le Faux Policier to become a faux policier. Confronted with the need to feed his family, Martin, this is a different Martin from the Martin of La Traversée de Paris, he really likes Martin, um, reasons that morality doesn't allow for his children to suffer from hunger and tuberculosis. The same theme holds true for the stories set during the war as well as for those set post-liberation, such as the case in the short story Le Vin de Paris, set in 1945. Comme tant d'autres, la famille du Villet vivait dans une perpétuelle nostalgie de manger. Les songeries des enfants, de leur mère et de leur grand-père étaient lourdes de boudin, de pâté, de volaille, de chocolat, de pâtisserie. As for the protagonist, Etienne Duvillet, he thinks only of wine. And alas, as he occupies only a lowly administrative post, he has no black market capital to obtain any. In La Bonne Peinture, also set after the liberation, the artist La Fleur, who has been unknowingly physically nourished by his own paintings, replies to someone who remarks on his healthy appearance, Vous me croirez si vous voulez, mais mes tickets de viande me suffisent. C'est tout dire. Later, when the nutritional value of his paintings becomes known, an elderly woman comes to him, telling him that she's hungry. As she sits in front of one of his paintings, she remarks, Les tickets de viande, les tickets de beurre, c'est pour ceux qui ont les moyens. Pour nous, les vieux, tout est trop cher. Once the government discovers La Fleur's special ability, they nationalize him, which consists of creating a whole system of bureaucracy surrounding his life and artistic production, while simultaneously ignoring the per pervasive hunger problems faced by masses of people. By the end of La Bonne Peinture, other artists have developed the capacity to create works similarly deemed efficace as the paintings have been designated. Musicians create music that makes machines work, poets' poetry provides warmth, sculptors' statues provide vigor, grace, and better figures to those who caress them with a hand or with a gaze. In this and other stories in the collection, lines between reality and the fantastical are blurred, with some confusion and questioning among the characters, but with general acceptance of the fantastical elements, which simply become a part of the otherwise mundane reality. There's no explanation as to why La Fleur's paintings become meals for those who view them, and those who are hungry don't care about the why. In La Grasse, God bestows a permanent halo on Monsieur Duperrier, the best Christian in Montmartre. Urged by his annoyed wife, who worries about what others will think, Duperrier tries out numerous sins in attempts to lose the divine gift. It stays firmly in place, even at the end, February 22nd, 1944, by which time the protagonist has become a pimp on the Boulevard de Clichy. In the story Dermuche, a criminal sentenced to be executed turns into a baby on the eve of his execution after becoming obsessed with the story of baby Jesus and sending a note along with the chaplain to deliver to baby Jesus. The chaplain places the note in a cradle in the chapel and voila, the next day officials discover baby Dermuche in the jail cell. But rather than marvel at the miracle, officials debate procedure and worry they won't get promoted if they don't carry out the killing. After the execution, one of the lawyers visits the town where Dermuche had murdered three people. Not only had no one there heard of any crime committed, but the three victims in question were all still alive. In addition to its supernatural characteristics, this is one of many instances in which M.A. criticizes the justice system. Religion comes back into play in La Fosse au Péché, in which a professor sells his soul to the devil in exchange for a golden calf, and eventually ends up at the bottom of a sea with a group of other sinners, including a pastor's family. The pastor, sent by God, then battles monsters sent by the devil, each representing a deadly sin, to regain the souls of those trapped there. Throughout these stories, the unbelievable becomes accepted as part of the daily routine. Or, as the pastor's wife in La Fosse au Péché says, Condamné en, en enfer, ce qui paraît être notre cas, c'est généralement pour l'éternité. Le mieux est de s'y résigner. 
Historians have pointed out potential dangers associated with going against the tide during the occupation, including loss of employment, poverty, and destitution. For example, David Drake asserts that, quote, even for those who were uneasy about or even opposed to the German occupation, adjusting to the new situation rather than taking a stand against it seemed, on the face of it, the most sensible option, unquote. And these stories, though, suggest that many situations in which characters find themselves were not inevitable and perhaps not even sensible, but rather convenient or personally beneficial. Beyond the supernatural, there are plenty of extraordinary situations, but which Aimé explains very matter-of-factly as part of necessary circumstances, as evident in the opening words of Le Faux Policier. Marié, père de trois enfants, Martin gagnait 3500 francs par mois à faire des additions dans une maison de commerce de la rue Réaumur et, comme il faut bien vivre, il était également faux policier à ces moments perdus. Martin's wife, echoing the pastor's wife from La Fosse au Péché, explains, il faut vivre avec son époque ou se résigner à disparaître. But the necessary circumstances also become an excuse for more transgressions and characters rationalize their own violence. Martin's actions as a faux policier become bolder and more violent. After experiencing an inspiration to kill one of his robbery victims, an old woman who had denounced a dozen or so people to the Gestapo, Martin has such a strong feeling of well-being that he starts killing all of those that he calls his clients. Consequently, he accumulates more loot, his family is happier, and his wife gazes upon him with confidence. To purge the nation of its mauvais éléments, he kills black marketeers, a maréchaliste, and une mauvaise femme who had slept with a German during the occupation, all while feeling divinely inspired in his mission. Several pages later, in another matter-of-fact statement, without further explanation, we learn, simply in passing, that il lui arrivait maintenant de rester une semaine sans rien tuer. Matter-of-fact killing and violence figure prominently in many of these stories. In L'Indifférent, the narrator explains, L'expédition à laquelle je pris part avec Gustave et deux autres jeunes gens de mon âge dura, comme prévu, un peu plus de huit jours. Elle n'était pas aussi dangereuse que les airs plastronnants de terre de nos compagnons auraient pu le faire croire à notre retour. Il s'agissait de piler des fermes isolées dans le pays d'hôtes après en avoir massacré les occupants. C'est assez facile. The halo burden du Perrier of la grâce in attempting the sin of anger moves easily from yelling at his wife to beating her, while du Villet of Le Vin de Paris, just after asking le grand-père va bien, attacks him with a fire poker while his horrified family watches. Killing the monster sent by the devil is not a choice, but an obligation for the pastor in La Fosse au Péché. The Martin of Le Faux Policier, upon accidentally killing one of his early robbery victims, is happy several days later when an aerial bombing destroys the evidence, which leads him to believe he has carried out God's will. Violence figures prominently in these stories as an everyday, accepted, and unquestioned reality for the characters. Casual remarks by characters in reference to this violence are shocking to readers, in part because they are not shocking to the characters, who live in a world of twisted or absent morality. The numerous ho-hum comments about grave topics, such as stating that massacring and robbing people is assez facile, suggest a serious and pervasive lack of morality in French society. There's much more to say about specific examples in the individual stories that comprise Le Vin de Paris, but I will conclude here with a few observations about the overall picture Aimé paints of the occupation in the post-war period in this collection. Firstly, it is one that is remarkable for how it portrays the behavior of French people towards other French people. In the stories set during the occupation, the German presence is occasionally noted in passing, but no Germans perpetrate violence. The bullies, thugs, murderers, and criminals are French people who scheme and perpetrate crimes and violence against strangers, but also against their own clients and neighbors. Basic human solidarity is rare. Aimé's depiction of this period is one in which the resistance does not appear heroic by any standards. When the resistance is mentioned, it is in the context of characters being pursued for punishment. It is a source of fear. Likewise, as it appears in these stories, the liberation does not appear to have resolved any problems. The liberation is not a source of joy or relief, but merely more of the same. More rationing, more hypocrisy, more bureaucracy, more injustice, more black market dealings, more bullying, and more violence. In Le Vin de Paris, the mirror that Aimé holds up to French society reflects a bleak world dominated by selfishness, hypocrisy, and injustice. 
He critiques the individual characters within his stories who display these traits, but also the government in general, and by that I mean in whatever form the government might take, for its failure to provide adequate basic necessities for the French, for its wasteful use of resources, and for its overall uselessness. Other intellectuals critique numerous aspects of the occupation and the liberation in the post-war period, yet Aimé stands out for confronting head-on topics that others may have been more reluctant or unwilling to address. Writing about Marcel Aimé in 1951, Claude-Henri Marcel asserted that Aimé se content de dire qu'un chat est un chat, mais il le dit bien et directement à une époque où tout le monde parle ou écrit allusivement. Marcel Aimé's frank expression of his opinion earned him a number of enemies after the war, but this did not prevent him from continuing to speak out against what he saw as injustices, without regard for how this might affect him. Although some scholars, such as Anne Simonin, suggest that Aimé's writings are an attempt to rewrite history, others acknowledge his valuable contributions in chronicling daily life of the 30s and 40s. Claude-Henri Marcel refers to him as a témoin sincère de notre société. Graham Lord attributes Aimé's collection of enemies to Aimé's, quote, desire to expose the truth, unquote. Aimé's biographer Michel Le Cureur also notes Aimé's skills of observation from his territory on the Butte Montmartre, from which Aimé promenait son regard aigu et lucide sur l'actualité de son temps. Ken Moray has posited that Aimé, quote, gave more attention to economic behavior during and after the Second World War than any other contemporary author in France, unquote. Aimé's depiction of France during and after the war may not be a positive one, though there are good people and glimmers of hope here and there, but it is one that we cannot ignore, and one that provides us with a valuable perspective on the experience of war from a contemporary intellectual intent on underscoring numerous moral shortcomings of French society, and in doing so, urging his compatriots to question their own behaviors and take responsibility for their own actions. Thank you.